All right, folks, uh, we've taken care of all the legal niceties, so I think we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Jonathan Abrams. I am an events co-chair for the Harvard Law School Food Law Society. Uh, I'd like to thank, on behalf of the Food Law Society, I'd like to thank you all for uh, coming out tonight. I think I speak for everybody in the society that we are uh, a little taken aback at how much interest there is on this issue, but I think you'll find that tonight we have four terrific presenters to discuss and debate a, uh, a very interesting and uh, relevant topic. Um, so first, a, an admonishment. Uh, if you haven't already been able to tell, this event is being uh, both recorded and live streamed over the internet um, as we speak. So anything you say is going to be recorded. So just putting that on the t out on the table. Um, and also before I introduce our presenters, I'd uh, like to uh, give some thank yous. Um, first of all, to uh, Lauren Rob Robliski and Christina Almandaris of the uh, Food Law Society for their help in putting on this event. Uh, the Harvard Law School uh, facility staff, the Harvard Law School audio and visual staff, they've all been terrific in, in helping us uh, put on this event. Um, a word about the format of this event. Uh, each of our four presenters is going to give a 10 minute, approximately 10 minute presentation. Afterwards, there's gonna be a little uh, back and forth among them, and then uh, we'll conclude uh, Till, until 8.45 with uh, questions from the audience. Uh, so uh, having laid that out, let me just give brief introductions uh, to our four participants. Um, first of all, for the pro raw milk side and to my immediate left is Sally fallon Morell. Uh, Sally is a journalist, chef, nutrition researcher, homemaker, and community activist. She is the author of The Fourfold Path to Healing, Eat Fat, Lose Fat, and the cookbook, Nourishing Traditions, the cookbook that challenges politically correct nutrition and the diet, Dictocrats, which is now in its second edition. She is also the president and treasurer of the Weston A. Price Foundation, a charity founded in 1999 to disseminate the research of Dr. Weston A. Price, whose work demonstrated that humans achieve perfect physical form and perfect health generation health generation after generation only when they consume nutrient-dense whole foods and the vital fat-soluble ac activators found exclusively in animal fats. The foundation is dedicated to restoring nutrient-dense foods to the human diet through education, research, and activism. Specific goals include the establishment of universal access to clean certified raw milk and a ban on the use of soy formula for infants. Uh, next to her is David Gumpert. He reports and writes about health and food issues. He is the author of The Raw Milk Revolution Behind America's Emerging Battle Over Food Rights, which includes a preface by Joel Salatin. His popular blog, The Complete Patient, has over the last five years been instrumental in launching a national discussion about government-imposed restrictions on the availability of nutrient-dense food and in highlighting an emerging debate over food rights. David is also author or co-author of six other books on various aspects of small business and entrepreneurship. He spent nine years as a staff reporter with the Wall Street Journal and seven years as an editor of the Harvard Business Review. Now, opposing them on the anti-raw milk side, if you will, uh, first is Fred Pritzker, who is the founder and president of the national food safety law firm Pritzker Olson. His firm represents survivors of foodborne illnesses and cases involving pathogenic microorganisms and natural toxins. The firm is involved in virtually every national foodborne illness outbreak. He has obtained numerous million and multi-million dollar recoveries on behalf of his clients. His firm is also devoted to educating the public and fellow attorneys about food safety and advocating for positive change in food safety laws. The firm's website, pritzkerlaw.com, provides comprehensive information about foodborne illnesses and its effects. He obtained his BA from Northwestern University and his JD cum laude from the University of Minnesota Law School. And last but not least, we have Dr. Heidi Kassenberg, who is the director of the Dairy and Food Inspection Division at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, the agency responsible for regulating food, dairy, feed, and meat producers and processors in Minnesota. Prior to her time at MDA, she was an epidemiologist at the Minnesota Department of Health. She received her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from the University of Minnesota in 1990 and her Master's in Public Health degree in 1997 from the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. Uh, so those are our four uh, illustrious guests. Um, with that, I will open the debate by inviting uh, Sally to the stage. Thank you.
Thank, thank you very much, Jonathan. What do I do now? <laughs> Just okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Public health officials choose their words very carefully when they talk about uh, uh, raw milk. Uh, our government officials say that re research has shown that there is no significant difference in the nutritional value of pasteurized and unpasteurized milk. That word value is chosen very carefully because actually if you um, analyze raw and pasteurized milk, you find about the same thing. There's about the same amount of calcium and the same amount of phosphorus, B vitamins, A and D, and so forth. But it's very different when you give these two milks to living creatures, living systems, uh, these are photographs of rats. The top rat was given raw milk its entire life. It's a very robust, healthy rat. The ones on the bottom were given pasteurized milk. They have hairless patches due to vitamin B6 deficiency. There's the same amount of B6 in both milks, but the B6 is utilized much more efficiently in the raw milk. The real uh, critical difference was in the utilization of calcium. Those on pasteurized milk had shorter bones, and the bones were much less dense, uh, showing that although there's the same amount of calcium in raw and pasteurized milk, the same nutritional value, uh, this calcium is used in different ways. It's used much more efficiently in raw milk. And this is particularly critical for growing children when they are forming their bones, <clears throat> and that bone density has to last them all their life. A study from the 1940s showed what happens to this calcium uh, when, the, when it does not go to the bones, the, um, these were guinea pigs, those fed pasteurized milk, had calcium streaked in the soft tissues. So the calcium was going to the wrong places in the body. Don't know how well you can see this slide. Oh yeah, it looks good up there. Um, this is just some of the references that we can give showing the uh, much greater um, assimilation, the much more efficient utilization of the nutrients in raw milk versus pasteurized milk. What is killed in pasteurization is carrier enzymes. In fact, the test for successful pasteurization is the destruction of a certain enzyme. And these enzymes ensure that 100% of the nutrients in raw milk are absorbed and absorbed efficiently. And no other food do you get 100% assimilation of the nutrients. Uh, one of these, for example, is lactoferrin, which ensures the assimilation of iron. This is why uh, children on raw milk do not get anemic uh, as opposed to pasteurized milk. Here's a study that showed that the iron was much more efficiently absorbed in the animals on raw milk. The animals on pasteurized milk were anemic. Same, same iron in both milks, but much more efficiently absorbed. One of the observations in this study was that the rats on the pasteurized milk uh, were irritable and tended to bite the researchers. And this is one of the most common testimonials that we get from parents who switch from raw to, from pasteurized to raw milk is an improvement in their children's behavior. <laughs> That's very important when you have a lot of children in the household. As for growth and resistance to infection, we have several early studies that were done in orphanages that showed that there was much better growth and much less infectious disease, including tuberculosis in children on raw milk. And we have recent studies with human milk, both raw and pasteurized, done on premature babies. And once again, you got much better growth and far fewer infections on the babies on unpasteurized human milk. Raw milk has been compared to blood. It has all the components of uh, your blood except for red blood cells. It has the leukocytes, it has the uh, immunoglobulins and the antibodies and so forth. And raw milk is actually designed to create an immune system. Raw milk also supports the proliferation of beneficial bacteria in the gut. And we now know that 85% of our immune system is these beneficial bacteria. These components are largely destroyed or compromised in pasteurization. So all these wonderful uh, enzymes that help you absorb the nutrients, all the components that help build the immune system are not there after you pasteurize. 
So we have a five-fold system in raw milk. Uh, it helps uh, these various enzymes and components reduce pathogens in the milk. They stimulate the immune system. They build a healthy gut wall. They prevent the absorption of toxins uh, in the gut, and they assure the assimilation of all the nutrients. Uh, these components are largely destroyed by pasteurization. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, findings in recent years is the great protection that raw milk gives against asthma and allergies. We now have four studies out of Europe, very well-performed studies, showing that children who start off life on raw milk have a far greater protection against asthma and allergies, including skin rashes. And the criticism of the first three studies was that this was farm milk and people were boiling the milk and it wasn't really raw milk. The fourth study uh, actually asked that question, did you boil the milk? And they found that there was no protection if the milk had been boiled. Uh, these studies uh, dovetail with all of the reports that we get <coughs> uh, from parents whose children have been uh, greatly helped with asthma, allergy, skin problems by switching to raw milk. Uh, and I want to point out that asthma kills about 5,500 people per year. It is a life-threatening illness, and the drugs that are used to treat asthma have many serious side effects, including growth retardation and weak bones. And isn't it wonderful that we have this food that is so curative and uh, helpful with, with asthma? Meanwhile, pasteurized milk is increasingly associated with health problems. This is in the scientific literature. It's, it's all there uh, in the uh, scientific reports. If a child has allergies, asthma, frequent ear infections, gastrointestinal problems, etc., the first thing that doctors do is tell them to get off milk because milk is our number one allergen. Pasteurization has taken this wonderful food and turned it into something that is bad for children's health and causes all sorts of problems. And this is the reason that the market for uh, pasteurized milk is declining at 1% per year. It's been doing so relentlessly for 30 years. Fewer and fewer people can actually consume this milk and uh, not have health problems from it. And this is accelerated by the fact that most milk today is ultra-pasteurized, <laughs> a process that takes the milk over 230 degrees Fahrenheit. You see this beautiful object here. This is lactoferrin. This is a typical uh, protein in the milk. These proteins are very fragile. And the process of pasteurization warps and distorts these proteins. The body no longer recognizes them, thinks they're foreign proteins, and has to mount an immune response. And this is the explanation for the increasing immune problems that we see in the consumption of pasteurized milk. The Weston A. Price Foundation carried out a survey in which we found that of the people diagnosed as lactose intolerance, whatever that may mean, 82% uh, of them could drink raw milk without any problems whatsoever. Think of the number of people, it's in the millions, that could be helped by raw milk because they can't drink pasteurized milk. Uh, this was a study not published, but it was just an informal study that uh, really needs to be followed up with um, in, at a university. Two calves, the one on the left uh, brought up on pasteurized milk, the one on the right brought up on raw milk. When they, uh, the one on the right was much more robust, much healthier when they did, uh, they butchered the calves. Uh, what they found was great integrity and color in the organs of the raw milk calves, and the organs of the pasteurized milk calves were kind of mushy. And this was similar to studies back in the 30s and 40s with rats and cats. They found the same difference in the organs <coughs> between the pasteurized and the raw milk. And guys, the, uh, the testicles of the raw, <laughs> of the raw milk uh, calves were 30% larger. A lot of you are going to be having children one of these days. What kind of milk do you want to feed to your sons? <laughs> we have the technology, uh, technology and the knowledge today to ensure that uh, all of our milk is safe and healthy. Uh, we understand the importance of the milk coming from pasture-fed cows. We know how to test. We know how to keep the conditions sanitary. We have refrigeration. We have much better testing than we did before. Uh, we do not recommend uh, raw milk from the confinement system. Uh, this is um, the 
filth in this system can really overwhelm the protective components in raw milk. So we do make a big distinction between raw milk from small farms where the cows are on pasture and uh, milk from large confinement dairies. Uh, I can't stress enough that healthy milk is full fat milk. Many of the uh, uh, antimicrobial components and the immune building components are in the fat of the milk. The fat's there for a reason. Nature doesn't make mistakes. So why, why the uh, opposition to raw milk? Uh, back in the 1800s, we had a real problem where 50% of inner city children uh, died before the age of two. Uh, this was called the milk problem, and it was blamed on the <coughs> milk coming from the swill dairies in the inner cities, which was admittedly absolutely filthy. But we also had um, many other problems at that time, including the fact that we didn't have the car yet. We had horses, and the number one health problem that health officials were decrying was how can we, what's going to happen to our cities? We have so much filth and so much manure. The, for a, a number of years, um, well, pasteurization was, a, was proposed as one of the solutions to this problem. The other solution was certified raw milk, and these two milks coexisted for many years. In 1910, a committee met in New York to decide which way they were going to go in New York City. Were they going to pasteurize or were they going to have certified raw milk? And they decided to pasteurize uh, because it was more convenient. It would cost the city less money. It had nothing to do with health or safety. 1943, Dr. Evelyn Sprossen of the London Hospital said, in certain institutions, children who are brought up on raw milk had perfect teeth and no decay. The result is so striking and unusual that it will undoubtedly be made the subject of further inquiry. What happened? What happened to the inquiry and the research on raw milk? Well, unfortunately, it was suborned by a new campaign starting in 1945, for pasteurization, it started with an article in Coronet Magazine, 1945, which uh, described a town in Crossroads, USA, where a whole bunch of people died of undulant fever from raw milk. Only problem was, whole story was made up. There was no town called Crossroads. There was no outbreak. And this is the kind of tactics that have been going on ever since against raw milk. The milk problem was solved by outlawing these inner city dairies, by improved hygiene, by getting rid of the horse, by improved uh, sanitation in the water supplies, and by the advent of refrigeration. It was not solved by pasteurization. In fact, uh, all of these uh, infectious diseases had um, gone almost to zero by the time that mandatory pasteurization came in. The conventional model puts the farmer out of business with low milk prices. A uh, farmer selling raw milk can get um, many times more for his milk. And this is the real reason that, pasteurize it, that raw milk is opposed, because the dairy industry does not want to compete with the high prices that uh, raw milk farmers get. Uh, conventional dairy farmers go out of business at the rate of 16 farms a day because of these low prices that they receive for their milk. And I believe that pasteurization is the number one reason for the decline in rural life in this country because it takes away the number one value-added product from the farmer. These are raw milk vending machines. They are all over Europe. Sometimes they're even paid for by the health departments in these countries, so the farmer can have an outlet for his milk. They sell raw milk, they're self-cleaning. Poland, for example, has 150 going to expand to 1,000. Um, they're in France and Italy. They're coming to Tesco supermarket in England. Uh, resources, uh, realmilk.com, please go to our website. We have uh, many, many articles, uh, very detailed and well-referenced articles. Um, the Untold Story of Milk by Ron Schmid, and The Raw Milk Revolution by David Gumford. Thank you. Um. We have some more seats up front. You know, please feel free to uh, come come a little closer. <laughs> so, David, just so you remember, just that just keeps. Don't go right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right in the phone. 
I think you've got mine. I think I'm still on yours here. No. Where am I? Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, I, I, I've I, first of all, I just want to thank the Harvard Food Law Society for putting this on, and uh, I want to thank our, our two opponents for, for coming. It's not too often we get to uh, actually have a debate about this subject in front of uh, 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 opponents of uh, raw milk, because they, they tend not to want to get out in front of a, uh, in a public forum like this, and so I, I really thank you very much. I appreciate what you're doing. Um, I have entitled my presentation, Raw Milk Safety Versus Rights, Striking a Balance. Uh, the reason we're here is that things have gotten way out of balance. We're witnessing aggressive propaganda wars, and we're witnessing government-sanctioned legal assaults against raw milk producers and distributors, led by people like those on the other side of this, milk, of this table. Uh, they're targeting small farms, and they're targeting increasingly ordinary consumers. These people are using cries of, quote, safety and protection to deny us something as simple as milk. And in the process, they're telling us we don't have the right to decide what foods we can put into our bodies. I'd like to uh, attempt to answer three questions here. First of all, how safe, or why is raw milk consumption growing? Second, how safe is raw milk? And third, do we have the right to access raw milk and other foods of our choosing? Now, our friends from Minnesota will discuss raw milk in, in terms, uh, or discuss food safety in terms of the risk from pathogens. But more and more people are afraid of other things. They're afraid of the hormones, the antibiotics, the GMO feed, the soy, the uh, new breed of antibiotic-resistant pathogens, the artificial sweeteners, and the processing, the various processing that's associated with so much of our food. So what's happening is that people are increasingly seeking out unprocessed and untreated foods, and fresh, unprocessed milk is a big part of what they're seeking out. But how many people are actually drinking it? That's been one of the big questions. No one has seemed to be able to provide a credible number until very recently. Um, just if, if in the last couple of years, uh, a number of raw milk advocates discovered that the CDC conducted an in-depth survey of thousands of people in 10 states in 2007 about their diets. And lo and behold, one of the foods that was asked about, inquired about, was raw milk. And the CDC found that 3% of those surveyed in these 10 states consumed raw milk. This was of, uh, I think, something like 8,000 people. So if you multiply 3% by 300 million people, you get 9 million Americans. And uh, as you'll see as I proceed through this uh, discussion, this is a very important number to understand. Now, before I get into the data, I'd like to, uh, I want to share with you some photos, because my guess is that our opponents will show you some photos, or at least tell you some very scary stories of people who've been paralyzed, suffered kidney damage, uh, other lasting problems from raw milk. Uh, I expect they'll also tell you about an outbreak in Pennsylvania just in the last few weeks in which 70 people became ill from uh, Campylobacter. And um, thankfully, none of them became uh, nearly as seriously ill as any of the people uh, in, in any of these photos that I'm aware of. But the reason I'm showing you these photos is so you can appreciate that these same stories exist with every single food you can think of 
any food you can buy in the supermarket. Uh, bad cantaloupe is the latest one. Late last year, it put the two men at the top into at the, in the top photos, two photos into the hospital for two months, and you see they're still uh, on oxygen when they're uh, when these photos were taken just in the last few weeks. Oh, I'm seeing that one. Okay. Okay, well, you see the two men in the top left. They were uh, victims of, of uh, eating cantaloupe with listeria, and they were in the hospital for two months. And uh, uh, after they came out, they're still on oxygen. They're going to likely have permanent disabilities. Uh, the um, woman on the uh, lower left uh, died from cantaloupe, from the cantaloupe she had. And the woman on the right is the widow of a man who died. Uh, his photo wasn't available. But in total, the cantaloupe contaminated with listeria killed 32 people and sickened 113, and some with lasting problems like those men at the top. Uh, same thing with bad ground beef and a hamburger paralyzed this woman on the left promising young dancer by the name of Stephanie Smith. The little girl in the middle spent several weeks on dialysis. The two-year-old boy on the right, he died. And both of these cases were from contaminated raw spinach. Now, I haven't heard anyone suggest that we ban hamburgers, spinach, cantaloupes, or even limit their availability. But any number of common foods that we take for granted can and do kill people. Eggs, peanut butter, luncheon meats, even pasteurized milk killed three people here in Massachusetts as recently as 2007. Yet there hasn't been a single death from raw milk since at least the 1980s. Now, I went through this little exercise because it's typical of the kind of fear-mongering our opponents do about raw milk. None of it, whether about cantaloupe, or hamburgers, or raw spinach, or peanut butter, or raw milk proves anything about what's happening in the big picture. When you look at the macro data, you find it's not nearly as scary as you would expect. Now, first, here's the data on the number of reported illnesses for raw milk covering the last 10 years. And um, I just want to say I drew this data nearly entirely. Oh, got to be careful of these buttons here. <laughs> I drew this data nearly entirely. Uh, it's, it, it was drawn nearly entirely from the CDC data by one of uh, Mr. Pritzker's uh, competitors, the Marler Clark Law Firm. Um, and what they did was they mined the CDC data for every possible illness attributable to raw milk. So uh, there's no cherry picking going on here. Um, what you see here is that there are between 25 and 175 reported illnesses from raw milk each year. Uh, in 2008, there were 132, and last year there were 50. Uh, what I did then was take a typical recent year for both raw milk illnesses and total foodborne illnesses is reported by the CDC. So we're comparing apples to apples. Now this next slide uh, shows what you get when you do this comparison. There CDC data, once again, shows more than 23,000 total foodborne illnesses reported in uh, 2008. And that number has been flat, pretty much. It's actually declined some uh, by 2008 from the previous four years. 2008 is the most recent year we have for the total number of, raw milk, uh, total number of foodborne illnesses. You have 132 of those from raw milk and raw milk cheese. That works out to one half of 1% of the total reported illnesses coming from raw milk. Now, 
you remember back to that earlier number I told you about, that 9 million Americans who are raw milk drinkers, 3% of all Americans, yet raw milk is responsible for a much smaller proportion of the illnesses. Uh, just as a uh, side note, about one-third of the illnesses of those 23,000 total foodborne illnesses are from beef, chicken, and fish. Now what this uh, macro data says is that raw milk is not a serious public health hazard by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, now, do I want to see the number of raw milk illnesses de uh, decrease? Absolutely. Do I think it can be done? Absolutely. And I think it will be because raw dairy producers are becoming ever more attentive to the problems of safety. That leads me to uh, a third question. Do we have the right to access the foods of our choosing? And uh, the FDA says absolutely not. Uh, what you, uh, in, in a federal district court case that's currently being tried in U.S. District Court, the FDA said in answer to, a, uh, uh, to one of the petitions, uh, there is absolutely no right, there is no absolute right to consume or feed children any particular kind of food. Now, you may say, okay, so let them spout off, let them say what they want, but they and the state agencies they highly influence are aggressively enforcing this edict around the country, even against people who've organized private groups, food clubs, herd share arrangements, and entered into private contractual arrangements with farmers to obtain milk and other foods. So this is milk that's being attacked that isn't even available to the general public. Uh, these photos are about a small private food club in Los Angeles. You may have heard about it, the Rossum Food Club. Uh, in the photo at the top, you see detectives from the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office uh, raiding the place in June of 2010. And if those of you who haven't seen this before, yes, their guns are drawn. Uh, the Colbert Report did a skit about the raid. Um, they had a lot of fun. You know, they turned the, the word raw into war and, uh, you know, but it's pretty serious, you know, the three people you see pictured below, they're associated with Rossum, and last August they were charged with felonies in connection with distributing raw milk. They're facing up to eight years in jail. So this is uh, serious business. The woman on the right, Victoria Block, told me that while she was in jail uh, awaiting arraignment, the other women prisoners who were in for, you know, dealing drugs and theft and prostitution, they asked her, you know, what are you in here for? <laughs> And when she told them, they said, almost in unison, you're in for what? <laughs> well, and she also, they also were amazed. She had the highest bail request of all of them, $60,000. So this kind of thing has been going on in other parts of the country as well. And I, I, maybe uh, Heidi can tell you something about Minnesota. Uh, there they shut down a private food club, just like Rossum, in the heart of Minneapolis. Uh, I shouldn't say in the heart. It was in a warehouse district, way out of public uh, shopping uh, way out of the shopping area. Uh, they have, uh, they just filed misdemeanor charges against a farmer there, Alvin Schlangen, uh, for distributing raw milk privately. He could go to jail for a year. His trial comes up in May. So once again, no one has gotten sick in any of these cases. So, so outrageous are these and other similar situations that people are resorting to civil disobedience. And a new organization has sprung up, the Raw Milk Freedom Riders. And they're openly, they're openly violating the federal ban on interstate shipment of raw milk, bringing raw milk across state lines. Here the, you, in the top picture, you see them coming from Pennsylvania into Maryland last November, challenging the FDA to arrest them. So far, the FDA has avoided them. Uh, and I, I think the answer, is the reason is pretty obvious. They'd much rather pick on small farmers than on uh, uh, organized consumers who know their rights. Uh, the next event for the Raw Milk Freedom Riders is going to be in Wisconsin in two weeks to support a dairy farmer there who's been engaging in civil disobedience by continuing to supply 200 food club members with raw milk. He was arrested at the end of last year and charged with three misdemeanor, excuse me, four misdemeanors, 
He's looking at possibly two and a half years in jail. That farmer is Vernon Hirschberger, and he's a father of nine children. So far, he's representing himself in court. And his bail term stipulated he discontinue supplying his members just to get out of jail. So he did that. He signed the bail agreement. He got home. He thought about what he had agreed to. He couldn't live with himself. Because he realized that he would be denying his members who depended on him the nutritious, wholesome food he had committed to providing them. Now, this is a picture of Vernon sitting in the uh, defendant section in the county courthouse. He went back to the court uh, and he read a speech to the judge that said in part, if our farm stopped feeding its owner's families, there will be literally hundreds of children who will suffer malnutrition and even starvation. Your Honor, I would much rather spend the rest of my life behind bars or even die than to be found guilty of such a gross sin before the Almighty God. I'd like to hear what the people on the other side of the table have to say about that aspect of this crisis. Why would you take Um, actions that deprive other people who depend on food for the good health. Um, why, another couple of questions, why can't there be more cooperation rather than confrontation? And why do you insist on ignoring the rights of free assembly and private contracts? Thank you very much. How do you feel about raw milk? How many people passionately believe in the virtues of raw milk? How many people believe that raw milk is a dangerous product that should be heavily regulated or banned altogether? Well, welcome. <laughs> and I'd like to talk to you about testicles of lawyers now. <laughs> Actually, I'd like to start by reading a quote from a book that I'm reading uh, by the Nobel Prize laureate in economics, Daniel Kahneman. It's a book that's available at any bookstore right now, Thinking Fast and Slow. Subjective confidence in a judgment is not a reasoned evaluation of the probability that this judgment is correct. Declarations of high confidence mainly tell you that an individual has constructed a coherent story in his mind, not necessarily that the story is true. We're driven by data. We live in a world in which data drives good policy making. Passionate belief that you have, absolute certainty in the virtues of your thought process are important and we all have our blind side. And I'm not suggesting to you that you do have blind sides, but I am suggesting to you that we should be looking at data. And what I'd like to do tonight is talk a little bit about some of the authorities and some of the data that really exists in this world. I got Gumpert stuff already. <laughs> I made it go around twice. So. I know. <laughs> this is one of the problems with raw milk. You notice the relationship between the udder and the anus. This is what the FDA has to say about it. Raw milk should not be consumed by anyone at any time for any reason. Now, why would the FDA say that? Why would the CDC say the same thing? Raw milk can carry harmful bacteria and other germs that can make you very sick or kill you. While it is possible to get foodborne illnesses from many different foods, raw milk is one of the riskiest of all. This is what happened, why pasteurization was brought into use in milk. It is one of the great triumphs of public health in this century. This was the problem that existed. This was a FDA poster 
from the Work Product Administration in the 30s, bringing about a problem, exercising an issue about the dangers of raw milk. Now, raw milk is still a problem. Now, one of the reasons that it is not a bigger problem, as Mr. Gumpert suggested, is because so few people drink it. Why do so people, few people drink it? Is because pasteurization has worked so well. Now, I am not a scientist, and I am not, you know, as a lefty myself, I am not in the pocket of big consumers. I represent people harmed by foodborne illness. I would much rather not have to represent any of you about raw milk because of the dangers that are associated with it. All right, so this is the current data about raw milk. These are the organizations that suggest raw milk should not be consumed. It goes from the AMA down to the World Health Organization and everybody in between. Now, is there a conspiracy here? Are all of these people <laughs> suggesting, do you honestly believe that all of these organizations are trying to limit your rights because of some inherent nefarious um, plan to rob you of your fundamental rights? Um, this case, has, this has been adjudicated. Uh, this was a trial in 1987 about whether the FDA could administer its own interstate ban on raw milk sales. The judge, who is a very respected federal district judge, concluded, it is undisputed that all types of raw milk are unsafe for human consumption and pose a significant health risk. Twenty states... And, and by the way, this is obviously the fact that in, under federal law, which has not been overcome by all of the changes in the legislature in the 25 or 30 years since this ban was enacted, hasn't been overcome at all. It is illegal to ship milk, raw milk, for interstate sales. 20 states ban it. 30 states allow it with some regulations, some very little regulations, some quite a bit. Now, this is the FDA's position. Is, are there any benefits to raw milk? Is there any objective data that supports the idea that raw milk is good for you and healthier for you and carries with it risks uh, that uh, don't exist for other kinds of milk? This is a meta-study that just came out, meta-analysis, by the way, I want to ask you all, do you, uh, any of you are familiar with PubMed, Medline? Okay. Have you actually looked at the literature? And if you did, this is a meta-analysis, and for those of you, and I'm not a scientist, but a meta-analysis is basically an attempt to look at, in this case, hundreds of journal articles. Uh, and then try to find statistical correlates to integrate the findings. And this is what the authors concluded. Overall, the results of this review revealed that high-quality scientific evidence to support potential benefits of raw milk consumption is generally lacking, and the public should interpret any claims with caution. Now, I'm not here to cast any aspersions on the panelists on the other side because I know they're good people who fervently believe in what they believe. But is the data there? Now, Mr. Gumpert was right. Um, I am going to tell you about people who have been harmed by raw milk. I would also like to tell you that unlike what Mr. Gumpert said, I actually represent people from the cantaloupe outbreak. And I represent people who have been uh, killed or horribly sickened as a result of ground beef. This is not an us versus them. This is part of the integration, the whole package. In any event, um, this is a case about Jim Orchard. Jim Orchard is one of my clients. And Mr. Orchard gave me permission to talk about his case. This is from the uh, Pittsburgh paper, and it is an exact, I, I thought it was highly, relati I mean, highly relevant to this kind of conversation. These were folks, Mr. Orchard is a very intelligent, uh, robust man in his 60s who, as this article talks about, had heard through his wife about the virtues of raw milk, and they were curious. So they bought the raw milk from a high-end, uh, co-op in the Pittsburgh area that was produced on a 150-year-old dairy by a farmer who tried to maintain scrupulous sanitation in order to uh, try to eke out a living uh, based on avoiding some of the uh, tyranny of big dairy, which I am not a supporter of. Trust me, folks, I'm not in the pocket of big dairy. I sue them all the time. Um, and anyway, this is 
Mr. Orchard now. He's a quadriplegic. Uh, Mr. Orchard uh, is cared for by his wife, who is his nurse. Uh, he continues to get physical therapy. Um, it's him in a Hoyer lift being uh, moved. Now, what happened to Mr. Orchard? Mr. Orchard developed Campylobacter as a result of consuming raw milk. Uh, and as a result of that, went on to uh, have Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, some people recover after long months of re uh, rehabilitation. Many people don't. Unfortunately, Mr. Orchard is not going to be one of them. Now, we talked about Mr. Gumpert was talking about the fundamental rights of human beings. Uh, I am a lawyer, and I have devoted my life to upholding the Constitution. I have sworn an oath to do that. Uh, we're in Harvard Law School, the bastion of um, freedom, judicial freedom, constitutional rights. Unfortunately for proponents, there is no fundamental right in the Constitution to consume whatever you want. I'd like to repeat that. There is no fundamental right. Courts have ruled on this since the founding of our republic. There is nothing in the Constitution, there is nothing in the inherent police power, nothing in the equal protection, First Amendment, or uh, 14th Amendment that suggests that people have the right to do whatever they want. When you get in a car, you can't go as fast as you want. When you drive and don't wear seat belts, you're subject to penalties. And unfortunately, that's how we live in an ordered society where there has to be regulation and sometimes decisions have to be made. Now, this is a passionate thing. This is, by the way, a quote, not my misspelling. Pasteurized and homogenized milk is just as dangerous in the long term as the radiation coming from Japan. Um, tough sell. Uh, you know, I've, I've been thinking a lot about raw milk since I was invited to debate here. This is the issue about fluoride. Uh, some of the same thing, some of the same issues. Am I past my 10 minutes like all you were? Well, I was right on time. <laughs> Actually, you weren't. Uh, but in any way, fluoridation, uh, fluoridation was the same kind of uh, issue. And in fact, it's been conflated by some raw milk advocates who believe that fluoridation, like the regulation of raw milk, is a conspiracy. Um, this is from a leading blog on the subject. Um, and I'd like to, you know, I, I wish I could talk more, and I wish, I'm sure all the panelists feel the same way, and I'm sure I'm up against my 10 minutes. but. Um, this quote came from the Blue Ribbon panel that was convened in Wisconsin, America's dairy state in my home state, next door to my home state. And it's about, uh, basically they were reevaluating raw milk in light of the push from good, good faith, good meaning people such as yourselves about raw milk. And this is what they concluded, in effect, that they believe after, and these were people from dairy, these were people, legislators, advocates of raw milk, eventually concluded that raw milk should not, is dangerous, inherently dangerous. If it is going to be sold, it needs to be regulated. And the study at the end, I mean, I, in my slides, which I'll never get to, uh, I have the site on it, and I suggest you read it. It's a 240-page document that was just released talking about regulation of raw milk, and if you would like an informed judgment based on people who have spent their lives thinking about it, you'll find it quite interesting, I think. Jonathan, how am I? Okay. Uh, all right, so for those of you who, you know, my, my personal belief, and I struggle with this because I like the idea of personal freedom. I like the idea that people can make informed decisions for themselves. I personally think that raw milk is inherently dangerous. I, I go along with the scientists. But if we are going to regulate it, I suggest, and we'll allow it, then I suggest we re regulate it very carefully. Um, you cannot produce raw milk without a license. You have to uh, have a certification that you have completed the requisite knowledge about it. You cannot maintain your licensure without continuing education. This is what lawyers do, doctors do, everybody does who is a professional. It makes sense. You also have to follow milk safety. By the way, agricultural safety, I'm on your side on this one. I mean, in the meat industry, with all the problems that exist there, for the last 20 years, there has been a push towards and, a, and, a, and frankly, some success, but not enough because I still make a good living, um, 
with a move towards scientific principles about meat sanitation. They should be applied to food. This is the use of HACCP plans, SSOPs, GMPs. These are good manufacturing uh, plans. SSOPs are sanitation uh, uh, standard operating procedures, prerequisite programs, basically using the best science available to make the safest products available. It should not be allowed to be sold to children or pregnant women or people with weakened immune systems. I know some of you fervently believe otherwise, but you're playing with fire. Uh, requisite insurance. This outbreak in Pennsylvania that has sickened people in four states, you know, you need to have insurance to cover the risks that are commensurate with the harm and the number of people who are affected. You need to have full and complete science-based disclosures on the product at the point of purchase and you should also have industry finance consumer education campaign just as you do with other subjects that are inherently harmful. Purchasers must acknowledge the risk and guarantee compliance with restrictions. I mean, if you go to a ski hill, you sign, you're, by buying a ticket, you're getting a waiver. When you park your car, you're acknowledging that you are waiving liability. It also enhances traceback so that when there is outbreak, you know who, the people who are affected by it and can warn them. Um, the administrative action, you should have government that has the right to order recalls, prohibit sales, suspend operations, and the burden of proof should be on the milk producer rather than the government because the milk producer, if they're selling a product that can cause harm, should be able to prove the safety of their product. Appropriate criminal deterrent for violations. Mr. Gumpert, I think, has unfairly characterize the authorities' actions on this part. These are not some government bureaucracy, conspiracy, trying to affect the rights of individual people. They're good people trying to regulate the health and safety of our community. Consumer protection, uh, I'll skip a lot of this. This is the data, this is the, um, the Wisconsin uh, report. I suggest you might want to take a look at that. Thank you, appreciate it. Within the next 10 minutes, I'm probably not gonna be able to sway those of you that fervently believe in the qualities of, good qualities of raw milk. But my goal is to put some questions in the mind of the people I call raw milk curious, and also those who proselytize about the benefits of raw milk to others, because there are some significant dangers. I've been, on, I've been fortunate to see a lot of the different sides of the food system. This is a picture of me and my sisters at uh, showing off my sister's uh, grand champion weather. It's me on the left, I'm the one without the, uh, without the cat eye glasses. The point of this isn't to embarrass my sisters, as fun as that is, but to show you that I did grow up on a farm. We grew up on a small farm um, in the Red River Valley of Minnesota. I went on to veterinary school and I worked on, this is me pulling a calf. So I worked on dairy, I worked on dairy cows. I worked on dairy farms. So for us, for our food safety advocates, our point is it's not about the milk. It's about the pathogens. And those are some pretty dangerous pathogens that can, that can come into the milk. What are some of those diseases? Well, we've got several. Historically, the reasons for pasteurization uh, tuberculosis, uh, undulant fever, brucellosis, scarlet fever, Q fever. Those are historical. Some of them are still around, although fortunately a lot of them have been eradicated or greatly limited. But we've got new diseases. We've got or, and recently discovered or recently discovered or recently emerging diseases, particularly E. coli 0157H7 that wasn't around when I was growing up. I drank raw milk, not a lot but I wouldn't drink raw milk now because of what I know with my public health training and with my veterinary training and what I've seen on farms.
These diseases are real, and they're real, they're real for the people that have been affected. Raw milk outbreaks, just in the last, that's roughly a decade. Um, raw milk outbreaks, 93. Thousands of illnesses, hospitalizations, and deaths. And that doesn't account for the children that may have long-term kidney damage that affects them throughout their entire life. Uh, two or more people affected. There have been numerous studies extolling the benefits of raw milk, and um, Mr. Pritzker um, debunked uh, many of those studies based upon a lot of methodological flaws. But even if we take the presumption that there might be some benefit to raw milk, um, this study, and I think um, Sally mentioned a little bit about this study, as far as finding some benefits for raw milk with allergies. But even these authors state that, however, raw milk may contain pathogens such as salmonella or EHEC. And that's the, um, another word, another, uh, that E. coli 157H7 is an EHEC. And its consumption may therefore imply serious health risks. So even the authors of this study that found a potential association don't recommend raw milk. And consumption of raw milk cannot be recommended as a preventative measure. Is this study intriguing? Yes. But it, does it uh, need further scrutiny? Absolutely. But is it a, uh, a cure-all for asthma? No. There's just too many um, unknowns about the safety of raw milk. A word about pasteurization. I was hoping somebody would talk about that so I wouldn't have to take the, my 10-minute time. Pasteurization is basically heat treatment. It's not anything... Uh, magical, it's heat treatment, it's cooking milk to a uh, low temperature, enough to kill the organisms that are harmful. It's not homogenization. And I think that's where some of the taste preferences for some people get confused. Homogenization is where they take the fat and disperse it throughout the product, where most milk that you get in the grocery store is generally homogenized. If you get non-homogenized milk, you get that nice cream layer on the top. And so who would, wouldn't like a big slug of cream? Of course, that tastes better when you're drinking it. So sometimes there is some, uh, some uh, misconceptions about what homogenization is and what pasteurization is. And currently it's a system in place to remove the pathogens from milk. Milk is a great product. It's great for humans, and it's also great for bacteria. Bacteria love milk. But there are also other methods. Um, to remove pathogens that are non-thermal. There's ultraviolet light, microfiltration, pulsed electric fields, ultrasound, cold plasma, and something that's really intriguing is high hydrostatic pressure. All that may potentially remove some of the pathogens, and if there are any benefits, which are yet to be proven, um, could potentially maintain those for those that like their raw milk. So how do the pathogens get into, into milk? Well, it's kind of the practical reality of a dairy cow. Man milk and manure are produced at the same end of a cow. <laughs> and dairy cows aren't, are not machines. You can't clean them out. Some dairy cattle carry pathogens. You can't tell by looking at them. Um, Pathogens that are harmful to humans, there are several that do not cause any illness within cattle, and they shed them intermitt intermittently. Dairy cows produce a lot of manure. They produce the weight of a small human every day. 125 pounds is a conservative estimate. I've seen it greater than 150 pounds. That's a lot of manure. So it's a messy environment. And despite people's best intentions, things happen. Milkers get kicked off, manure starts flying, animals poop. It's not a sterile environment. Good intentions are not, is not a good public health intervention. And very small numbers of bacteria can cause illness, less than 50. You know, there's millions that can be of bacteria that can be on the head of a pin. And in some cases, some udder infections, that's the, the udder is where the milk comes out, can result in bacteria getting into the milk. So what if I get uh, milk from a farm where everything looks clean? Well, unfortunately, 
there are numerous points along that whole process where contamination can occur, from the utter all the way to the collection, all the way to bottling. And does a farmer, when you look at that, does a farmer keep or clean every inch of that udder? I don't know if you've actually looked at an udder, but looking underneath it, it's very hard to look underneath. And there's not a lot, the lighting isn't always the greatest within dairy <laughs> parlors, the milking, the milking area. So can you keep, do they get them scrupulously clean every single time? What about the manure, or what about the milking area and the milk house? Are they kept scrupulously clean? What about keeping chickens and other animals out of the milking barn or in the cow area? Because they can transmit disease as well. This is the, perhaps the more likely experience on some farms. And this is a quote, this is what investigators of Washington County, or wa state of Washington in one of their outbreaks. It was easy to see potential problems. He doesn't exactly study the udders to make sure He's cleaned every last inch, and it's messy. On a recent visit, uh, one cow, who was sore, fussed as Brown started milking, uh, started the milking device. She pooped, splattering Brown's face, but he didn't seem to notice. She fussed so much that the device fell to the floor, and the cow stepped on it. When Brown finally got her off of it, he sprayed it with a hose, and then he put it on the next cow. So while some people think that clean, you can find just by looking at them, or if the farmer has good intentions, that you can get milk that doesn't contain pathogens. But we're really looking at just a question of degree. Are you looking at a chamber that has one bullet or multiple bullets? And you're, you're really playing a game of Russian roulette. Then I'll move on to testing of raw milk. So OK, we can't control it. There's a lot of points. There's a lot of variability within uh, the milking system. What about testing it? Why milk testing isn't enough? This ought to pique the interest of the lawyers or the budding lawyers in the audience. Absence of evidence is an evidence of absence. So testing of a milk has some er inherent errors in it. Contamination, as I mentioned earlier, is sporadic. It doesn't always happen. It also is unequally distributed throughout the milk. You take a, the collection point in most farms is the bulk tank. It's not evenly distributed in there. So you take a sample, you may not have picked out the part of the bulk tank that contains the pathogen or the contamination. Likewise, if you're bottling it, you take a sample of a couple bottles of milk. It's, you might pick those bottles that don't contain the contamination. Additionally, if it's mishandled, bacteria can multiply. As I mentioned, uh, bacteria love milk. Bacteria can multiply during shipping um, if it's not properly refrigerated and handled. Another point I'd like to, to bring up is the economics of raw milk production. Is it really worth betting the farm? Because there's been numerous lawsuits by people who have been sickened by raw milk that have sued the farmer that has produced that milk. Civil liability. Will insurance companies underwrite policies for producers who sell raw milk? They probably will, but you know, it's going to cost quite a bit, and is that co it may not be cost effective to get that insurance. The deductible may be too high to make it cost prohibitive. Will current insurance policies become void if insurance companies become aware that our producers are producing raw milk? So those are some questions, and it makes you kind of question about the economic viability of raw milk production. And then free choice and regulation. You know, when you say free, free choice, you're really talking about the trust of the ability of consumers to exercise free choice really assumes that the information used to make these choices is based in fact, is based on data. Consumers have limited time, energy, and inclination to conduct research. That's why we have the system that we have. People are removed from their food system. Rightly or wrongly, that's the reality of today. 
And food safety has been a part of government since colonial times. They've abdicated that role for government to be the proxy for the consumer. So what I'll leave you with here is if, if you go to real raw milk facts, there are several cases of children and adults that have been sickened by raw milk. And this is a particular case that illustrates a well-meaning mother who thought she was doing the right thing by serving her child raw milk. Unfortunately, he went from a happy, healthy child to one who put on a respirator. And now he's facing perhaps a lifelong injury to his kidneys. And as I said, she thought she was doing the right thing. And even kind of the, I know, godfather of the locally food, food movement states that people should be able to buy raw milk if they want to, but shouldn't turn a blind eye to some of the food safety concerns. Thank you. Thank you to all four of you for what was some really interesting presentations. Um, I realize there's probably a lot of issues brought up that you want to respond to, but we started a little bit late, and I want to leave as much time as possible to the audience to ask questions, and hopefully through those questions, some of, these, some of the responses you'd like to make to each other will, will come out. So um, we're going to open up the, the area to questions from the audience now. Just a few things. First, to remind you, this is being recorded. Um, <laughs> Uh, second off, um, uh, we have uh, two individual mics um, that will come around, and please do not start asking a question until you get one of those mics. Um, please direct your question to an individual presenter or one of the sides, and also, um, if there are other people waiting to ask their questions, just please be considerate of that and keep your questions succinct. So if anyone has a question, raise your hand. Hi, this question is for Ms. Fallon Morell. Uh, Mr. Pritzker presented a number of slides that said that there are no health benefits to raw milk, and I think before we could actually have a debate, these were directly contradictory to the ones you had presented. What is your response to whether or not there are real health benefits to raw milk? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> what we find is if the study comes out and says there's a benefit, then the other side said this is not a good study. I mean, we see this all the time. The new meta-analysis that's come out, we are working on a rebuttal. I don't have it yet. I w I'd hope to have it by this evening. But I think these studies coming out of Europe on allergies and asthma, they are excellent studies. They're large studies. The authors are put on a rock between a rock and a hard place because they have to s kind of spout the you know, the industry line that raw milk is dangerous, but asthma is dangerous. You know, asthma kills thousands of people every year. These are good studies that are coming out of Europe, and there's more, more to come. Hi, thank you. Um, first, I had a comment, Dr. Kassenberg. Thank you so much for pointing out that milk comes from the udder. Um, that was, you know, edifying. Um, but I wanted to ask Attorney Pritzker um, on doc, um, on Mr. Orchard that was sick, and how many other people in the milk club were also made ill by the milk? There was an outbreak involving, it wasn't a milk club, uh, this was commercial sales, and there were actually two outbreaks from the same farmer. He had uh, his product recalled in 2008, Dean Farms, you can look this up, uh, because there was Campylobacter found, uh, there was an outbreak of Campylobacter. They looked and they tested, and as Dr. Kassenberg <laughs> pointed out, difficult to find it uh, because of the lack of uniformity in the inoculum. So they let him produce raw milk again, and then in 2009, the re-outbreak uh, sickened my client and I think seven or eight other people. I'd just like to add to that. We heard from the health department in Pennsylvania that there were 40 people who got sick in that area and that most of these had not drunk raw milk or all of them had not drunk raw milk.
Uh, I have a question for the lawyer. I forgot your name, sorry. Uh, did you ever represent any clients about pasteurized milk? Did they ever got sick and you have to represent them in court? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Did I rep ever represent people who got sick from pasteurized milk? Yes, as a question. Uh, no. The answer is that I would perfectly, I'd be happy to take their case if they came along, but no one's contacted me and I'm not familiar with any outbreaks involving pasteurized milk at the present time. I'm an equal opportunity taker. <laughs> question in the back? A couple of sort of informational questions. Um, the, the, the last speaker talked about spoilage. How much of the pasteurization has to do with spoilage issues? Uh, it, it is, it, in other words, does distance from the source of potentially raw milk have something to do with this issue? Does this whole story have something to do with sort of commercial agribusiness interests in the modern age who want to be able to ship stuff and guarantee its safety? Uh, which may not be the same level of concern if you live near a farm. And while I'm on the subject of your, your last remarks, you closed with a, with a quote from Michael uh, Pollan. Um, is there something wrong with that quote? I mean, that, his quote, although there's more to be investigated within the content of it, seemed like an, a reasonably sensible, balanced approach to this, and is, is that something um, you agree with, and finally, I, ha I have prescribed narcotics in my bag. You know, you know, legally, you know, legitimately prescribed. I didn't, I didn't have to. I didn't have. To, I'm not aware of. I mean, I had to sign a statement, but I have to admit that I didn't read it. Um, uh, but I, I, I mean, what I'm, what I'm concerned about is that there may be inordinate, given the level of risk, trying to understand the level of risk that may be there for raw milk, and I'm sure there is, and I think it's important for to understand that. How about looking at this in, in, in the context of the fact that we have Mac thousands and thousands of McDonald's everywhere in this country and nobody seems to really want to do an awful lot about the horrendous, you know, or the, the way uh, hogs are raised, you know, in these horrible situations. And, you know, it's sort of like, where is the raw milk danger in, in the context and the, and the importance of doing something about it in the context of the horrors of the overall agribusiness food system. Well, how do I begin? I, um, how many questions was that? Um, three. <laughs> three. Three? Okay. Oh, am I supposed to? No, it's no, on. No okay. finger on it. No finger on it? Okay. All right. Well, I guess I'll start with the one about Michael Pollan. You know, I would say that he, even he thinks that their raw milk is dangerous. You know, we need to look at the dangers of raw milk. That was my point on that slide. Um, a question about kind of the conspiracy in government. I've been working for government probably about no, 15. Okay. You know, I guess food safety is really size neutral. You're going to get problems with small producers. You're going to get problems with large producers. And it depends upon the management of each individual case. A small farm isn't necessarily safer than a large farm, and vice versa. And as far as McDonald's, I'm a food safety regulator with, uh, you know, acute diseases. I'll leave that to, to others to, to ponder. I have a question for the lawyer, please. Um, the man, the 67-year-old man with the disease, which I cannot pronounce, um, and you blame that on raw milk, but that disease is happening more and more, and I thought it was an autoimmune deficiency or something on that order. Uh, do you have any statistics that show how many people get that disease and have actually consumed raw milk? Or how did we know that raw milk caused that for him? I think you've asked a very good question about basically how we prove cases of foodborne illness. And I think that that is a, an important issue for all of our discussions. Basically, it's a combination of three different specialties. Medical causation, a physician through the appropriate test diagnosing a certain condition. 
In that case, it was Campylobacter. Campylobacter is highly correlated with foodborne, with food. Second of all, you have epidemiology. Epidemiology is a science in, in which public health officials use statistical analysis and gumshoe. I mean, basically going to the places, trying to investigate, and Heidi can speak to this much better than I can, um, and then using statistical probability, very sophisticated statistical analysis. And then the third area is microbiology, basically being able to differentiate one uh, pathogen from another, and then using gen genetic fingerprinting is called pulse field gel electrophoresis, PFGE, which is basically comparing the genetic fingerprint of a pathogen from one source and comparing it with another. And basically, it's molecular fingerprinting. And that's the combination of those three things used in a very sophisticated analysis are how we are able to trace back and attribute a particular pathogen to its source and the source of an outbreak. Could I make a comment <clears throat> about pulse PFGE? Um, a recent uh, person, Dr. Martin Weedman, who's violently opposed to raw milk, came out with a statement saying that this could not be used it was not a good way of fingerprinting similar organisms. So I think we have to be very careful um, about some of this testing. Uh, we, it's, it's not particularly accurate in pinpointing what, uh, you know. Actually, it is what, incredibly accurate. And, um, and no, in it's fact, not. You're, re you're reading gels. Actually, <laughs> I know Dr. Weedman. He's been an expert on the other cases at Cornell. And there are tests that are even more particularized, MLVA, MVLST. These are high. In fact, some of these tests are so highly specific, you can differentiate everything from everything else, and they become useless. PFGE is the gold standard, and it has been. There are new tests that are working out. And not so surprisingly, in a lot of the outbreaks given these new developments, they are using both tests, MVLA and PFGE, to correlate these particular pathogens. So, I mean, the literature is beyond dispute, really. Question in the back. A, a question for uh, either David or Sally. Uh, David, you, I think, uh, very graciously, I'm over here, uh, okay. welcomed <laughs> civil and rational debate. Um, and, you know, presented a fair bit of scientific evidence, and then um, Fred turned around and, you know, accused you of being <laughs> irrational and having no evidence on your side. Um, I, I'm wondering, as an advocate in, you know, in similar issues, how, do, how, are, you, how are you experiencing the, the debating tactics, you know, in this world where, you know, one side tries to engage in a, in a respectful discussion and, and Another side basically says the evidence is that all these you know these very powerful authorities should just uh, decide and you should follow their orders. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I mean, I was curious uh, for, with. Um, I, I I should say I'm kind of curious just to hear this discussion because, like I said at the beginning of my talk, we don't get to have this discussion too often, so I, I don't hear the, these arguments. Uh, ex, you know, expressed in a public forum all that often. I, I read about them, and, and um, but I'll just say I thought f uh, it was interesting. Fred used the word data um, in uh, in in uh, presenting these um, uh, uh, various health organizations and um, uh, various experts, and so forth. And I I, I guess I, I don't see that as data. To me, data is numbers. Uh, by and large, at least the way way we use it in um, the scientific uh, uh, terms of scientific information and uh, uh, statistics. Uh, but um, so uh, I, I did. I was, uh, and I, I actually um, was surprised that I, I was surprised that they actually. Uh, uh, oh, let me just put it this way: I, I was listening for some uh, rebuttal. Of the, of the data, the actual data, the numbers that I presented, and I haven't heard it. And I'd, I'd be curious of um, what, what they have to say about the, the reported illnesses uh, from the CDC, this is all CDC data, uh, total illnesses, raw milk illnesses, 25 to 175 per year, and um, 
and, and it doesn't seem to square with the, quote, data that raw milk is inherently dangerous. I guess so I, I'd just be curious to hear, about, hear what they have to say. Go ahead. I guess from your presentation, you weren't real clear about, you kept switching back and forth, so I wasn't actually able to see what okay. uh, your data was presenting. So, but if you could just briefly summarize your point on that, was that that what your point was about that pasteurized milk is a problem, that raw milk is not as good of a problem. I guess I wasn't okay. grabbing your point. No, I, I, I yeah, I guess, um, first of all, I also think it's important to, to state that I, I, don't, I don't think that, um, I do think that uh, raw milk is riskier than pasteurized milk. And I don't think anyone here uh, who, who advocates for raw milk is suggesting that we should do away with um, pasteurization. Uh, that's not, you know, in the, in the discussion. So I, I wasn't doing a comparison of uh, raw milk uh, versus pasteurized milk. All I was doing was uh, showing the number of raw illnesses from raw milk over a 10-year period, which ranged between 25 and 175, uh, versus the total number of foodborne illnesses reported by the CDC, which is on the order of 23,000. And so that, that, that percentage varies. Uh, in 2008, it was one half of one percent, and but in other years it's even it's less than that. Like in 2011, it was 50 illnesses, so you'd be at about you know less than a third of one percent. So and we, we uh, the comparison I was making was to the uh, the data we now have that three percent of um, of Americans are consuming raw milk, which is nine million Americans. So you have one half of one percent or less of the total foodborne illnesses caused by raw milk uh, in a in a population of uh, where comprised of three percent of the population. So it's a, it seems like it's a it's a uh, under underrepresented, as it were, um, considering how many people are, are consuming raw milk. Um, the data is pretty clear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, which in which direction? Raw milk is a dangerous, okay. a dangerous food. All I right. mean, um, one of the one of the things is you got to look at if we don't even know how many illnesses there are out there. Well, we have an idea. We, 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 know that we, know, we know the reported illnesses, which reported is, illnesses? yeah, and, and usually there's a multiple of 20 to 40. For each illness that's reported, between 20 and 40 illnesses are unreported. But you multiply all the whole, all the whole you know, the 23,000 by between 20 and 40. I don't know what, you know, and then you multiply the raw milk illnesses. So it's the same, it's the same uh, scale, well, one half of one percent. Move on to another question. Well, yeah. okay, I just... Okay. Uh, Yes, sir. I like and enjoy kefir. Is kefir safe from both sides? It's a process in which you don't pasteurize the milk prior to inoculating it with the cultures. Can you, what are you asking? <laughs> <laughs> is, is kefir safer than milk, than raw no, milk? No, so if I made kefir out of pasteurized milk, that's safe. Lots of people do that. If I made kefir out of raw milk, is that substantially more hazardous or likely to be dangerous than making uh, or just drinking raw milk straight? It's like yogurt. <laughs> I pronounce it kefir. <laughs> I don't think there are any reported illnesses yeah, yeah. from kefir. I don't, I don't think we have any reported illnesses from kefir, uh, but uh, you know, kefir. But I, I think what you see is the proliferation of lactobacillus, which, um, first of all, um, produces lactase that eats up the lactose or digests the lactose. So it's very good for people with lactose intolerance. And uh, you get the proliferation of lactobacilli, which are extremely beneficial in the gut and crowd out uh, pathogens. So, so my question was, has anyone on the panel actually compared the percentage of people that consume raw milk and get sick for, to the percentage of people that consume pa pasteurized milk and get sick? Do we have those side-by-side -side figures anywhere? I don't think we know how many people consume pasteurized milk. I'd love to know so we could do that. You look, the, you look on it as a per-serving basis and Yes, there have been outbreaks associated with pasteurized milk. That's because milk is a great media for growth of bacteria. 
and it can, that can get can contaminated after it's pasteurized. That's true. But if you look on the per serving basis, the overwhelming evidence shows that raw milk is much more dangerous than pasteurized milk. You have to look at the per, per serve. The, I don't have them in front of me, but those studies have been done. Yeah, yeah. I, I would really question that because we know, for example, in California that we had to go through freedom of information to find the recalls and outbreaks from pasteurized milk products. And I think a lot of these are just not getting recorded from pasteurized milk. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions. Yes. Do I have to push my thing? Okay. Um, I have a question kind of moving away from the risk um, debate, which seems like it could go on forever, um, but more towards the food rights kind of choosing what you eat. Um, and I worked as an intern for the Mass Farm Bureau, and we worked on some legislative um, uh, things, and one of the things that kind of I learned from that was that there's different states. In some states, you can just buy raw milk at the grocery store. Some states, you um, can buy it directly from the farmer, and some you can't at all. So it seems like, if I'm right, there's those three categories. Um, I think it's like 10 states or something like that you can actually buy from the store. One is Maine, where I'm from. And, um, some, and I think Massachusetts, you can buy it from the farmer. Um, and which way, I guess this is a question for the lawyer or anyone to answer, but which way is that sort of moving? Is it moving in the raw milk is you can't buy it, or it's moving towards, um, which way is it moving in the three categories? I, look all the, I love the questions all directed to the lawyer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Not> that far. <laughs> Call me Fred. Fred the lawyer. In any event, my brother's here? No, anyway, there, I think th my understanding is that 30 states allow the sale of raw milk 20 prevent it. Actually, I'm sure Sally would probably know this more than I. My understanding is that it's essentially static, that it's not moving one way or another. But I will tell you that this is, you know, what I said before in my remarks about, you know, fundamental rights, constitutional rights, ultimately this is a political issue. And enough people want legalization of raw milk, there's nothing in the Constitution that will prevent that. There was nothing to prevent it being regulated as well. So it's a matter, ultimately, of political will. Thank you. I had, uh, my name is Ron Schmidt. Um, I'm the author of the book, The Untold Story of Milk. It was on the screen before. And just a qu quickly on the uh, sickness from pasteurization, in 1985, there was a widespread recall uh, problem with uh, plants in uh, Illinois that resulted in over 100,000 uh, illnesses, according to the... Uh, medical journals that published the articles about it. Now, I have a question for all four on the panel. This debate has gone on for well over 100 years. It's always safety. Is it safe? Is it not safe? And there never will, this, this question will never, I don't think will ever be settled. There'll always be two sides. My question for the four of you is, what is freedom if not the right to choose the food that you want to eat? I'd like each of the four of you to please answer that. Yes, and it's also a question of the pursuit of happiness. Um, as many of you know, I'm, I'm known for something called the Fallon formula. It is a, a baby formula based on raw milk from my book, Nourishing Traditions. Thousands of babies have been on this formula. We've had nothing but good reports. I, that's not scientific, I know, but I would love for someone to do a scientific study on these babies. I would like for our opponents here to put themselves in the position of a mother who has a baby who is not thriving, who is not growing, not gaining weight, uh, either on her breast milk or on infant formula, who's got digestive disorders, and she puts them on the raw milk formula and the baby just takes off. The color comes to the baby's cheeks, the baby's happy, the baby's growing. I feel that there is a lack of a, a kind of hard-heartedness against this situation. And I would like you to put yourself in the situation of these mothers who have been, their babies are literally saved by raw milk, and understand uh, where our passion comes from and our belief in our right uh, to give this food to our babies.
My son is severely physically and mentally disabled. He has a genetic order, disorder. He's 26, and he functions at the level of a two-year-old. So I know about children who don't thrive. And I would have done anything in my power, if I could, to make him healthy, to have him grow up to have a full life. But what I will never do is allow anecdotes to drive good treatment and good science. Unfortunately, life is like that. I live with it every day. My son lives with me and my wife is here as well. We know what it's like to have a child that doesn't thrive. And if there was anything that I could do to make that a reality for my son, I would do it. But I would never do it unless there was demonstrative data supporting the validity of milk or any other treatment. So I do know that life. I, I just, well, I, I think uh, Ron asked uh, each of us to say something. I just wanted to say a couple, oh, I'm sorry. You know, there was, ma'am, I don't want to take anything away from your experience, but I don't know anything about your experience. I can only talk about mine. And I don't know about the wisdom of what you've done or not done. And I know I can tell by just talking with you that you are a caring and loving mother, and I would never suggest otherwise. But this really isn't about ultimately about what I do with my son or about you do with your son. It's really a, a debate that I think, as the previous speaker said, that we could talk for the next 20 years and we'll never resolve it. If it worked for your son, I wish you well. That's all I can say. I, I would just like to say, uh, you know, that, um, there have been, uh, Fred made a couple of references that the U.S. Constitution doesn't uh, uh, refer to food rights and, and compared it to uh, 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 automobile licensing and automobile rules. Um, the, uh, the U.S. Constitution doesn't refer to food because uh, in those days there was never even the, the, the slightest thought that food would be an issue. And uh, uh, it, it was, uh, it was so it's, it's one of those areas that's not, um, that's, that's uh, not brought up and, and thus, um, it, 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 so it has to be interpreted by the courts if 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 and when it comes up, and uh, uh, it, it, so there, there's, it, it, it just want to clarify that uh, driving and f cars are a privilege, food is not a privilege, and that's what I'd like the the comparison I'd like to make. Um, I also think that uh, I, I guess the, the question maybe Fred w didn't answer that Hillary raised there is um, you know how and, and the question I raised in my presentation how can you really uh, since she's had this experience, which we respect, I certainly respect that, that that's happened, that she's had this experience, how could you possibly deny that food to her and her family? And I just, I guess that's where it really comes down to. Because that's, that's what the anti-raw milk people are saying, is they want to deny that food in the interests of trying to um, uh, uh, save uh, people from uh, coming into contact with pathogens. 
David, when uh, our founding fathers created this country, the life expectancy was probably about 37 years old, and it's through the advent of public health and the development of objective-based science that we are all here living the lives that we live. So I don't want to get into the idea of original intent by the United States Constitution, and I certainly don't want to make policy based on the emotional issues associated with my life or the questioners. I think public policy should be driven by much more than that. Sir, sir, we have to we have to cut it off. I'm sorry. I, I realize we're all very passionate about this issue. We can go on all night, but the, the fine people at Harvard Law School have to, you know, go home too. So we need to wrap it up. The, the, if you could join me in all thanking the presenters. Um, do you want to get a photo of you guys? Um, the, um, all finish. the presenters, uh, uh, I think we'll stick around for a little bit to uh, talk one-on-one -on -one if, if you so choose. And also, um, before you leave, um, Mindy Harris from NOFA would like to make an announcement. So. So I wanted to bring this philosophical conversation, thank you very much panelists, down to the practical level. Welcome to Massachusetts. Raw milk is legal in Massachusetts. It is, you can buy it directly from your farmers. And I just wanted to make an announcement for those of you who are interested in purchasing raw milk. You can get a brochure from me. We have a list of all the raw milk producers in the state of Massachusetts. And if you're interested in the policies that are going on at the Massachusetts legislative level, go to nofamass.org. Very good discussion. Thank you, Mindy. And yeah. just be clear, yeah. food sock is ambivalent on the issue. <laughs>